Nimanti Rajasingham Ferreira, welcome. I'm so glad to see you again. And the fact that you're here makes my job so much easier because ever since I read this book that you had uh, published in 2018, I was thinking, you know, we need to discuss these issues that you're bringing up. And especially I was thinking we need to discuss this in Singhala which I'm hoping to you know, do with you at some point and also give an explanation in Singhala because it lays bare some of the ideas or some of the concepts that we have naturalized in this country, which has led to so many problems uh, in recent times. And the fact that academics like you go back to the past and unravel how some of these were put in place and that there was nothing natural about it. And it was a very conscious decision of either you know, business interest or colonialism, which technically was business interest, if you think about it. I think these are good things to know because um, we might act on other, other impulses, thinking we are either defending the country or ethnicity, when actually we are not and we have been caught to things that were constructed much earlier than you know, we were born or decades or centuries before. So I like that kind of educational um, intervention, if I may say that, because it makes us look at the world in different ways. And for me, that is the end result of education. So thank you, Nimanti, for this book. And thank you for being here. Could I ask you very quickly to introduce yourself? Sure, thank you, Madhu, for having me. Um, it's wonderful uh, to talk about the book. First, I want to say that this book is uh, has just this is a Sri Lankan edition. I think you have the one in the US, but it's yes, almost, almost the same, same, right? Yeah, very similar. Okay. It's just come out of Thumber Panya Academic Publishers. So if you go to their website, you can purchase a copy of the book if you're interested in knowing more. Um, but I teach in the English department and the women's studies program at Colgate University. And I've been there for about now seven years. So it's in New York. Um, and I teach post-colonial studies, critical race theory, women's studies, um, theater and performance. So cultural studies broadly. Okay, great. So um, this book is so varied, Nimanti, because all five chapters deal with different issues. So I'm going to take my interviews with you as a series. Okay. And today I will only speak about the introduction where you actually speak about the birth of the concept race, which I found very fascinating. It might be new to some people who are listening. That is why I thought I'll take this slowly. You know how race, race is complicated in Singhala because we don't have many terms for it. Mm -hmm. It will be Jatiya, right? And you know, nationalism, ethnic group, everything comes under Jatiya. So we'll be really stuck for, when we do in Singhala, we'll be stuck for the nuances that exist in English, but we'll take the problem at that time. And here you start, like for example, your introduction starts with the um, title Capitalism and Race, because I also want to mention that this book is a very firmly and clearly takes a leftist stand mm -hmm. and implicates capitalism and it's working within the birth of the concept race. And you show that you, we are really playing into the, into the framework set up in the world by capitalists. So it's a very clearly anti-capitalist anti stand and a leftist stand, which, and which you prove as being, this is the reason why we are like acting the way we are. Um, very recently I did um, a, a small lecture on ideology mm -hmm. to say that very often we don't know we are working within a particular system of ideas. And here, the one you're critiquing is the capitalist um, ideology. So capitalism and race, here you're talking about race, like in present day, we consider race to be the black and white difference. And we call the ethnic groupings like ethnic ethnicity, which you deal with later, but here you're talking about race. And Nimanti, I would have explained this before this interview is aired in, in very simple terms. But I'm fascinated by the fact that you're discussing this with what you call ethnographic fiction, mm. which is fiction, creative writing, 
of which you know I'm, I I consider myself to be basically a creative writer as well. Basically, that first, everything else second. And can you give me the definition of ethnographic fiction first? We'll go to the title as part of the introduction, and why you think it's important that we consider this while we are doing a serious study on like the economy or the, the, the system in Sri Lanka. So first a definition of this and why it's important. Sure. So, you know, um, a term that you could have substituted for ethnographic fiction is realism, for example. You could have said, well, isn't this what realism does? It tries to document and capture the social world in fiction. Right, so yeah, strictly speaking, the characters are fictional. There's not a real, say, Nisanka in the story, in, in the real world, you know, and the stories may believe, but you're trying to capture like a sense of the world, right? Why I choose ethnographic fiction instead is at one level, I think the novel form, um, as it's theorized, emerges through and through and with colonialism and travel writing, right? And when Western scholars theorize the novel, they don't consider how significant colonialism is for the emergence of the form. They always think industrial, industrialization, the working classes, right, under capitalism. They don't think of like the slave plantation or, you know, the colonies as much. So I really wanted to make that explicit. The second is that I'm really uh, influenced by the work of Mary Lewis Pratt, who's written a, you know, her, her very well known book is called Under Imperial Eyes, but she's written like a, lots of essays on this topic too, which is that she says, you know, the travelogue or the travel narrative, you know, of sailors going to other countries and then documenting their experiences and bringing it back home. And then those books becoming like the template for the next generation of sailors and travelers, right? That that form gives birth to both the novel form and what we now call anthropology, right? Both are rooted in the travelogue or the travel narrative. And that in, in the original form, like for example, I look at Robert Knox's physical relation that I rely on, that is both. There's his impressionistic, uh, contemplation of his life, etc., that eventually becomes, you know, the novel form, right? The realist novel. And then he's also trying to document like plants, customs, Rajasinghe, her, was he a good king? Was he a despot, right? So they're both in one text. And in the 19th century, as modern disciplines develop, they get separated. That's, that's uh, Pratt's argument. Yes. I think um, like calling it just, just, go ahead, sir. Just to interrupt you there, and you, before you get into colonialism, say how that kind of writing justified exploitation as well. You start with the Irish people. I'm just going to go a little bit back and look at just your beginning. There you say this kind of description, which we consider objective. Mm -hmm. gives reason for people to be exploited without feeling bad about it. And you've given right at the beginning, capitalism and race, how that link was made. Could you just talk about this Irish um, example you have given, which will come later to the colonial and the Knox thing, but let's do the global. How did global race come up? Now that you explain what you are doing in this, uh, what you meant by ethnographic fiction. Sure. Let's look a bit back. How did the global sense of race come up? Sure. I mean, uh, so just one thing you can say is like ethnographic and fiction, right? Just to tie it in is that ethnography is claiming it's documenting the truth, but it's inventing things, right? It's saying, yes. oh, we're just describing what we see, but it's Absolutely. really made up stuff, right? Yes. So in terms of global capitalism, um, there's a, it's a debate uh, between what is the relationship between race and capitalism, right? So the term is racial capitalism and Marxist kind of, uh, his scholars have written a lot about it. Um, so, 
at one level, right, you could say that the plantation emerges with the plantation economy, with slavery. That's when race emerges, right? And there are people like Ashil Mabembe, Barbara and Carol Fields, they have this work where they look at how in the beginning, in the American plantation system, um, say it's tobacco and then later it's cotton, right? Um, and then later, kind of. so initially white and Amer Euro-Americans and Africans both labored in slave-like conditions, right? And so they kind of asked the question, well, when did it become just black? Like when did race emerge as the way to organize the plantation, right? So Karen Fields and Barbara Fields have this amazing book called Racecraft. And they say, well, it emerges when after the American Revolution, right? When freedom was something that Americans were told was their birthright, right? Once they overthrow the British from the US and they say, get out of our country, right? Then freedom becomes important. And then you had to think, well, how come some people are not free, right? And so like, as you mentioned, uh, Madhu, like then ideology becomes important, which is that you have to produce an argument for why some people don't deserve freedom. And so race becomes the way you say, well, some people are inferior, right? So these ethnographic fictions said, well, black people have are not really developed, right? Africans, their skin color marks their inferiority, they're, they're childlike. Um, they're heathens also. So, you know, they don't deserve freedom uh, the way Europeans do, right? So race is, is, is developed and becomes a discourse and a practice uh, to make sense of why some people could, should be exploited when others should not, right? And this doesn't necessarily have to be black colored people. It could be white. Yeah, yeah. right. You know, and that's what people have written about, right? The Irish historically, you know, if you think of Ireland as one of the earliest colonies of the British, today we think the Irish are white, but historically they were not considered white, right? The N word, terrible depictions of Irish as black. I when, didn't know they were, uh, they had the N word applied to them. I did not know that as a historical fact. Frequently, right? And so in factories, um, they were treated badly, they were paid less. Uh, so there's a way in which even within the working classes, there was a way the Irish were treated as inferior, right? So um, there are debates about you know, race, but I would argue that race emerges in, in relationship to capitalism when exactly is debated among scholars, right? Um, but I would say there is a relationship. It's not causal, but it's an entanglement and you, you have to understand them as this dynamic formation and look at different exactly. to, to consider it causal would be to simplify a yeah. very complex process. But I found it fascinating that race could have begun because people wanted to justify some wise one category that didn't deserve what another category did deserve. So I, I found that fascinating. And uh, I'll be doing this chapter, you know, as an explanation in English, Nimanti. Uh, so yours is just an addition to what we are doing. And yeah. the, the book that you uh, considered from Sri Lanka, yes. to talk about this, which comes right in your introduction is uh, When Memory Dies by Sivanandan. Yes. And you have said Sivanandan saw race, both as a local phenomenon by being a Tamil in Sri Lanka and then getting into London where you, you say he walked straight into the Notting Hill riots. Right. So he saw that, you know, the, the, the black issue. And then he went on to found, did he found, like, was he the founder of Race and Class? Yes. Could you give us an explanation of what that journal is and how he's involved, um, Himanti? Sure. So Sivanandan is a very, very important writer, right, for us. And if you know his work, When Memory Dies, it really tries to understand the labor movement in Ceylon. And, and the novel ends in 1983. Yeah, it was also translated, if I may just add, translated recently, Mataka Marunusanda, I think, Hasita Abhivardhana. So people can actually get this. In, in yeah, so he 
really try to think of a history of labor that was not divided along ethnic lines, right? Um, but I think why I find him so important was he's really, um, so as a Tamil, he was very committed to kind of thinking of Tamil rights, thinking of equal rights for Tamils and Sinhalese and I would say Muslims for all communities, right? But because he left to go to London and he lived there after the 1956, you know, the Sinhala only act and after, um, he also understood how Tamil politics and black politics could intersect. So for example, it may interest you to know that in England, South Asians were part of the black British kind of movement, right? Like along with Afro-Caribbean people, South Asians were also marked themselves as black and they claimed that identity. And so for him, he understood this clearly that being black was not like the color of your skin. He says somewhere, that was not the color of my skin, it's the color of my politics, right? So he understood that coding people as ethnic, right? Uh, Tamils as Dravidian, Sinhalese as Aryan, right? Or people from Africa as black, Europeans as white. That these were not natural categories, that they were ideological ones. They were made up for reasons of power, right? So for him then, for South Asians and Afro-Caribbeans and African people to be black was a label that you claimed because you had experienced racism and you had experienced exploitation as people who were colonized, right? So for him then race is not natural. And so he really fought and he thought that claiming blackness collectively gave uh, people who were from different places a shared like space from which to, to fight against racism and structural racism and exploitation, right? Um, so, you know, against racial capitalism, right? So he, he uh, joined the Institute of Race Relations in England and in London, and it was a very kind of liberal bourgeois institution. And once he became director of it, he transformed it. Right, and it became a much more radical institution that tried to connect with the working classes. Um, and he also then was the editing, the founding editor of this very important journal, Race and Class, right? Where he tried to think of how they came together and intersected. Um, so that's him. And I great, take great inspiration from his writing because you really try to think of like Tamils and, you know, black populations in England immigrants, like he tried to think of the ways they connected and the ways you could think of their relationships, not to dissolve differences, right? But to understand our shared histories and struggles. Nimanti, uh, I'm just curious, after When Memory Dies, did he ever go into creative writing again or was that his magnum opus and he never went back there again? Oh, I don't know if he wrote other words. It's, it's, it's kind of, yeah, because he's, that's a very good novel. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's very uh, historically, Thanks. I would say, accurate <laughs> as, as well. And I found it a, a very well-written novel. Okay, so just to um, move on to what happens later and how it applies to Sri Lanka specifically, right? Mm -hmm. We go back to Knox, where you say this, see, colonialism is part of exploitation and capitalist exploitation because they came here basically for the raw material that we had. And in the case of Sri Lanka, spices, right? And it was before the Englishman actually, it was a trading company that came first, later before it became all governance and state. And in the Dutch, it was again traders who came before yes. they kind of theorized it into, into governance. And then surely this start of the concept race would really have helped them to justify the exploitation that the colonials went through, right? The, the colonized went through. So this was a, like a natural, it was a natural um, development of that concept of race, right? Yeah, I, I think it's a development to justify exploitation. And it emerges, I think, with colonial sciences, right? So something like Edward Said's Orientalism which I also draw from is very helpful 
to think about how like, you know, some a place like Ceylon becomes marked, right? As, as simultaneously exotic, but dark and other, with the people that had had a great culture and civilization once upon a time, but that it had gone into decline and that the British were there to uplift and restore the greatness that was Ceylon, right? Yes. Due to the great singular civilizations, right? So in that process of ethnographic, archeological, right? Reconstructions of the past, right? And lots of people have written about this, right? Um, there was a way in which the different racial groups become codified. Correct, right? correct. Right, and that-, that this, to go back to Knox, I'm sorry because I keep interrupting you and putting you forward and backwards. To go back to Knox, right? You were saying the colonial project was based on, you know, the Baconian thinking of objective description, which I find fascinating because they think they're objectively describing, which gives, opens the doorway for absolute, you know, prejudice thinking to come in. And you use Knox's, um, you know, the, 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 what was the, what was the name? 15 years ago. Historical in Relations. Historical Relations book to demonstrate what you're saying. So I'm going back to the place I interrupted you before. Sure. So um, Rob, Robert Knox's book is kind of, and you say it's not really he who put the final format into place. It was, a, it, it was somebody else who was influenced by Francis Bacon right, who was very, very popular at that time, his way of scientific thinking. Shall we discuss Bacon and what scientific thinking, and I'm putting quotes there, uh, is before we get into the, the rest. I'm taking you very slowly through this. Yes, so um, it's about kind of the emergence of natural philosophy, right? Yeah. Which, yeah. Bacon was a central figure. And his writings kind of imagined that you could go somewhere and you could see the truth, right? Objectively, transparently. So when you went somewhere and you saw something that was reality and that you could grasp it, right? And that the eye could capture, I'm simplifying, but yeah. that the eye could capture thing, things. And you could think like today, you know, as we are in this moment of planetary crisis, as you know, we've destroyed this planet, right? As a climate crisis emerges, we can think about Baconian thinking as the roots of how man as someone who could capture grass, discipline, subdue nature, right? Emerged. So the kind of the human has been able to codify, fix, understand, discipline for his own purposes, animals and the natural world, right? And of course the colonized kind of somehow became part of that process too, right? We were seen as being much more natural and less civilized, right? Um, so Baconian thinking would refuse the fact that, for example, the observer actually doesn't just grasp something simply objectively, right? That one's own identity, right? Whether you're a woman, um, a man, a child, your race. One's own prejudices, surely. <laughs> yes. There's a historical yes. moment from which yes. you you're writing from, the place from which you've come, all of those may influence what you see and what you don't see, and what you ignore, right? And that what you think you're just simply describing is actually a series of in interpretations and creations, right? That's why ethnographic fiction, you're producing knowledge. And I don't mean fiction as just false knowledge, but also imaginary creative thinking. So that, that so Robert Knox, thought was, you know, he's, so he's a sailor, he's a working class guy. And so he's in Kandeuda, right, in Kandy for 17 years and he escapes. And they say he wrote this, his notes on the ship journey back, but it is heavily edited by members of the Royal Society. It's published by the East India Company, right? So they were really at the time, they wanted travel books to entice the British readership, right? of the pleasures of travel, that you can travel and have access to natural flora and fauna and see this wondrous world. And that the land was there for you to grab and the people there would be so welcome, right? Because you were there to uplift them. 
So Robert Knox does all this, right? Um, what's interesting for me about Knox is because he's writing, I think the book came out in 1681, he still is uncertain of what race is. He can't codify, right? So I, um, I wish I could show you the images. Maybe I can just do it from the book. There are these, uh, there's one place, you know, I don't know if you can see this. Is it clear? Right? It's, so, a, it's just that the most interesting one you haven't shown, Nimanti, which I'm very disappointed about. You said he had, the printer had given the, uh, you know, of, of a very fecund uh, singhala. He's no, just, here, here it is. Can oh, you that's see? the one? That's the one. Oh, okay. That's so one. in the book is this copy um, of the Candian noble woman, right? Okay. Yes. And then in an interleaved copy, which is where Robert Knox, you know, his book, his printer gave him a copy of his book with like blank pages, right? Okay, yeah. He himself sketched this image. And there it is, the Silanese or the Candian woman as fecund, primitive, nude, you know, curvaceous, primitive, right? It, it's very strange, those, um, those pictures, Dimanti simply because as you have said, he seems to have sketched European uh, features onto them. Onto the first one, right? Exactly. The, the first, first one, one. yeah. That right. is, um, and the first male and the female, uh, the male also. Yes, the two. Two. yes. Yeah. So Not the, yeah. yeah, so I'm kind of interested in how both could exist, right? Both the kind of, non-othering kind of representation and then his own sketch which is completely kind of othering um and i think i i try to say that he he's uncertain yet of what race is and this is before race as anatomical physical difference it's before it's codified right right, right. In the whole text he does that he says oh the silanese are just like europeans at one moment they look just like us their culture is just like us and in another moment, he says, "Oh, these black people." Exactly, and 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 I'm going to read some things which I which I which you also mentioned. I I think it's important that we emphasize that um, you know Francis Bacon's proposal for scientific inquiry attempted to banish from the emerging fields of natural philosophy all imaginary thought, mm. so that you know uh, it's just what you see, as you said, and. Um, also that classification therefore was also a way of control yes it's always about control who controls the the knowledge itself because codification is to is to give um, is to give absolute um control to the codifier right and i'll, I'll read this sentence Campbell documents Bacon's desire to produce objective scientific knowledge extracted not merely out of the depths of the mind, but out of the very bowels of nature, which would lead to the control of nature by scientific experiments. Classification was central to how nature was categorized by natural philosophers and sailors alike. So we are going to the roots of the colonial project in which they could therefore justify what they did and put it on nature. Yes, with no no imagination. It's just no ideology, ideology. Like so that kind of a brilliant move, isn't it, Nimanti, to call this natural and scientific? Well, I don't think they thought they were not doing that. I think you know, Francis Bacon and scientific experiments and the emergence of kind of modern science. Right, people would not imagine that how they they understand the world and how they carry out experiments are not simply a transparent fact, but are conditioned by various factors, right? I mean, I think they, they believe they were doing enormous human service, right? But once it's taken to the colonies, then, you know, there's at one level ethnographies, then there's also things like the census, there's archeology, span all these different sciences, right? Then participate in that project of kind of describing but also simultaneously inventing. Exactly, and Ira Vikram Singh and you know people like Andy, I think, have uh, documented how the census mm -hmm. concrete, like made concrete, the kind of amorphous ideas of race that we had in the country. And going back to Knox Nimanti, you say Knox's confusion is very clear, but he puts maybe geography and politics as difference. 
when he you know travels through the jungles he sees who he calls malaba and they are different not he doesn't get to race they are yeah. governed by politically different people and they are physically different so region is one and religion very strongly was another differentiating aspect right could we just uh, discuss on that a little bit how religion played part of making somebody the other and not so much race so in kind of medi especially in the medieval period in europe especially i think and you know i mean this is a debate so you know there's this scholar cedric robinson he has a book called black marxism he would completely disagree with this he would say actually race precedes capitalism and existed in medieval europe it's just expanded and reworked but it's not a, a construct that emerges with capitalism so i want to make clear it's a debate but typically it's also true and i think scholars often side on this side of the argument that in the medieval europe when you said someone was black you mean they were not christian at least that was a, one of the dominant ways of thinking blackness not as biological or anatomical but actually religious difference right so i think what's interesting so i i'm not certain what side of that debate i'm on but i think robert knox demonstrates that he's uncertain how to read when he says black he means heathen sometimes you're not a christian so you're black your soul is black right and at other times then the singhalese are or the kandeudu people are just like europeans when he goes to kind of the malabar regions he's not noticing physical anatomical differences at all their linguistic their religious their geographical differences the differences of who's governing whom right that these are independent kingdoms he doesn't mark like physical differences between the tamils and the sindhis in any way um, and that was yet to emerge by the exactly. 19th century right yes. and then and and there's a case of how language played a part in all this because he says i think the very first sentences they were um they were dark and he then like what's the very first sentence that you use um and you say you know language you just put two adjectives together and that's enough to you know that's enough to make things natural i'm i'm looking for the um the sentence there because you also have uh, pointed to language there yes um so i think he says when they're separated right when the english when are separated yes that that's why you say right um, he says oh no we're going to be separated yes. right yes. Uh, and then we're going to be stuck with these heathens and we don't speak their language we won't have anyone to talk to exactly so when he's talking about these black people he's talking about oh religiously they're different and now they speak this other language right right so, these are the codes by which difference is marked yes so not uh, not the exclaim this made where we could have none other to confer with all or look upon but the horrible black faces of our heathen enemies squared adjectives slipped in to the sentence which puts black if you draw the line i, I love this drawing the line thing black mm -hmm. on this side he that on this side enemies on that side right. so that you know you don't question you don't slip into where the words join right. to consider them not naturally fixed right and and beautifully you say in the very next line in this example blackness and heathenism seem cotominous by language seems also to be part of what constitutes difference so how because as a writer nimanti i'm fascinated about how language naturalizes things in ways so cleverly and subtly disguised that we hardly question it and sorry and, go ahead yeah well it's a side of meaning making and ideology right and so if you think of the larger argument in my book which is that you know our present ethno nationalism either singular buddhist or tamil and or the ethno racism within our countries are really tied to global capitalism or neoliberalism right that's the main argument of the book i think that we have to really pay attention to how language is deployed because it makes we don't see the links but if we pay attention to language and push and interpret 
then we see how things fall apart, right? Exactly. Yes. And so I think like even Knox, uh, I think, is it Sarojini Jai Vikram? And she has a book called- Writing Life. That Conquers, yes. He reads Knox really as this open racist. Yes. Right? <laughs> yes. And I kind of, I agree that he's, you know, he carries the baggage of where he came from, but he doesn't quite have the language yet. And this is before British colonialism, and I'm not saying under the Dutch East India Company, uh, which was kind of dominant at the period, right? the dominant empire, that racism was absent. But Rock Knox doesn't quite have the kind of language and the codes yet, right? So he's using things, and when we look at his, his use of language carefully, then we see like the instability, and then we're like, oh, race is not natural at all, right? He doesn't, he's not objectively seeing things and describing what he sees. He's actually drawing from different debates around what the colonized are. And he's right. But the colonial project as a whole, Nimanti, mm -hmm. would have accepted race as a factor, right? For them to come and say, we are the superior race. Race as a factor would have existed for them to have the audacity to do that and to consider some people as being you know, to order people in a hierarchy? Well, I would say that it's not there before, but it emerges with. And it's yeah. uneven and, uh, and context-specific ways. Yes. Right? And because that's a point you make in this, in this book. It's yeah. always context-based and that race can easily be assembled. We will get to the title at the end of this uh, discussion that you assemble it depending on how you are going to use it in that context. Sure, and I'm not just saying that it's easily movable and you can just kind of move it around, but I yeah. think what I'm trying to say is that race emerges at certain moments within certain contexts and we have to be really careful about, about paying attention to language and history to understand those emergences, right? So the Dutch East India Company and the British and the Portuguese they're not interested in being racist for the sake of it. They're interested right. in profit, right? Like slavery wasn't about white supremacy. It no. was about profit and planting it's about money. Yes. Right? Yeah. Uh, we have to keep that link present. Otherwise, you imagine that racism is for the sake of it. Yeah. But if, if it is an ideological formation and a practice, then it emerges in the context of you know, how do you justify certain make or certain practices, right? So the East India Company wasn't there to be racist. They were there for profit and race worked. It, it helped. Worked. Exactly. So uh, what would okay. otherwise be an acceptable behavior, right? It's Justification right. for absolute economic exploitation right. was given through the framework of race. Maybe we could term it that way. Yeah. So I, I loved the... Um, um, you know, writing to conquer. I love that phrase because writing and literature sadly was very much part of this naturalization process, right? And here, um, while Knox's book is an early example of how writing to conquer function in an historical relation, Knox and his editors did not yet have clear ways of codif codifying the differences they encountered as race. And that's where we said, you know, geography, politics, even religion, mainly religion was, those were the markers of difference and not something specifically called, um, you know, a race. And here you go back to say, uh, you're talking about a, a book called Complexion of Race by Roxanne Wheeler. Mm -hmm. It explains that in the 17th and 18th centuries, race or blackness meant differences caused by climate, humor, skin color, religion, and even clothing. Right? So how does clothing get to this? Do you know, Nimanti? Well, I think it's just that, you know, you mark difference by the way people dress. And you said, well, here are the, the, the primitive peoples, here's their clothing, right? You know, it's fascinating if you this you know, just consider the scarf and, you know, the, the Muslim, um, it's still going on, no, in a weird way, clothing as being the something that to, to mark difference. And that is a very present, present controversy right now in sure. Europe. And then that, you know, and that the Muslim woman, because she 
she does not want to display her body in the same yeah. way European norms insist on. Exactly, you know. Uh, racially other, backward, unfree, oppressed, right? Yeah. That's a hugely different, another, you know, two hour, dis infinite discussion on that, how, how even clothing had to be codified to be accepted, yeah. which is, I think, which is a mistake all of us are making, even here. Um, without getting too much into that. Right, so um, I, um, if, when you get the book, I, and one day I hope this is going to be translated, Nimanti, I honestly do. Well, and you, this is why, you do it. <laughs> till, <laughs> till that day, at least let's talk about this in Sinhala, and I'm very aware that your Sinhala may not be very much in use because you, you lecture in the USA. Mm -hmm. And um, also, your Pereira Raja Singham, which parent was Singhala Nimanti? My mother. My mother. Okay. My mother. So, you, are you actually very bilingual or trilingual? No, I'm actually, uh, I speak English and Singhala. Mm -hmm. And I don't, because of, you know, during the war, there was a lot of kind of, I went to the Singhala medium, I grew up with my mother's side of the family. And there was a lot of like shame and trying to pass as Sinhalese for me. I know, and a very sad instance you say is you were told to uh, use Raja Singha as opposed to Raja Singham, which is, I think, a very sad thing as a country. We got people to do, not to be proud of the heritage you were from. Well, you know, Colombo was full of checkpoints and you were often harassed um, if you were Tamil, you know, and you were often treated differently. And I think from my mother, maybe this was her way of trying to protect me. I was a child. And I think she thought, well, if she could just, she's half Sinhalese or she's my daughter, she's facing all this hassle because of her Tamil name. And is there a way she could just say she's Raja Singha and then she won't be hassled or harassed, right? But of course it's a losing game because you're outed, you have to show your ID at some point or it becomes clear your father is Tamil. And then, you know, it, it, I think I struggled a lot with that. And then during that time, then I, will, I didn't learn Tamil because there was a part of like my father's Tamil. I was very close to my father's mother, my grandmother, paternal, but there's a way that Tamil was seen as like, let's not go there because it's easier in Colombo to survive. If, and I think if I went to the Tamil mediums class, that would not happen right because my all my friends would have been done but that didn't happen and I was in a single medium class and schools are a place of kind of nationalism and you know so there you go right yeah. that's a that's a past we should never forget and what we made people do so yeah I guess that that's on us right so um uh, Nimanti so we will try this in Singhala as well okay okay with, sure. whatever, <laughs> with whatever Singhala that you have Okay, yeah. so and we will. Um, I'm trying to keep this lecture short because I think being a YouTube channel, it's it, it's good. You you end by um, so before we get into Leonard Wolf and Village in the Jungle, Knox's example was used to show how the process of colonization used this kind of scientific writing, right, and codification, and. Um, whatever they, the way they looked at the world to justify the exploitation that came with the colonization project, Yes. right? And that you also show, secondly, that during um, Knox's time, race wasn't very clearly established in what they called, not even Ceylon, or no? whatever this island was called during that time. What, what was it called? I know Knox calls it Kandauda. Because but, he's going to the Kandium. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Kandauda probably became Kandy, no? Yeah, but I think uh, Ceylon was used, right, at this time? I think that was just the British. Okay. We both, need to, we both need to find that out. But uh, then by the time Wolf came, mm. Leonard Wolf and Village in the Jungle, and that was much later. Yeah. And there you're seeing the emergence of race as, as a concept in Sri Lanka. Because by that time, many things had happened and, and the pure undisguised trading had gone away and kind of a more gentlemanly governance had come in of which Wolf at the beginning thought he was part of and later obviously not. He saw what, what was happening under that name. 
Mm. And then you uh, discuss village in the jungle. And this is where I will stop this particular discussion at the end of your introduction as being one that shows how um, ethnicities are being built in Sri Lanka. And also you pinpoint to the danger because even wolf postulates just one ethnic group as going to be the inheritors of the independent country. And even at that point that the fictions were making people outsiders, right? Sure. Yeah, go yeah. ahead. So, you know, I think Wolf May is, is important because he was an anti-colonial writer, right? I mean, I'm going mean, to look at the, the, the description of him. He was here from, I've forgotten now the dates, right? Uh, from 19, uh, let me see. The, I'm trying to think of the years he was here, 1901 to 1911, was he? He was an assistant government agent. Yeah, um, 1904 to 1911. Thank you, yeah. And so then he goes back and he's so disgusted with what he had to do. He was appalled, right? And um, he resigns from the Ceylon Civil Service. And so his first anti-colonial book really is, he wrote a lot about Africa, you know, and the colonization in Africa and how much Africa was plundered by the British, right? Oh, what was his experience there, Nimanti? What, what he, gave him the right to do that? He never went there. I think he just did ex a lot of research. I mean, he was very uh, devoted to the Labour Party, right? And he was kind of committed anti-colonialist. So he wrote this massive document kind of criticizing the British and their presence there. And it's a really interesting story where they found in his libraries, you know, that uh, Virginia Woolf was the one who did all that research for him, like hundreds and hundreds of little cards where she had done all this historical research, right? But her name is never in that. I forget the title of his book, but- That's another feminist point which we will not get into. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so but this is his first kind of fictional attempt. Um, and this is really uh, different, say for example, from Ian Forrester or Kipling, right? Because he doesn't have a Western protagonist who's, lead, who's telling the story, right? For, so for the British reader, kind of this white figure who's under, even if you're critical of empire, that presence is very important in the in no, form like normally, right? But Wolf kind of does away with that. They are, they are still the center of attention, in fact. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. They guide you through, but Wolf doesn't have that, right? Uh, Sindhu is the poor kind of farmer, Badagama, and he is the focus, he and his family, right? The white presence is very, it's there structurally, but they're not the center. Um, so I think what for me was really surprising was, um, that Wolf, with all his anti-colonial credentials, and this book, you know, Bad Bagamuna, like when the film came, right, um, it was very popular, right, and it had Stella Cass. He was seen as this amazing. So the novel is loved, right, but he has this footnote, right, um, and maybe I should just read the footnote. I don't know, uh, Madhu, if you wanted to read it, translate it into singular. And then, I will be doing the singular separately, but I will be translating. Okay. So just, just go ahead. Okay. Um, and so he says, uh, this is in page 38 of my book, right? And this is a footnote in the novel. He says, there are two distinct races in Ceylon, Tamil and Sinhalese. Their language, customs, and religions are different. The Th Tamils are Dravidians, probably the original inhabitants of India. They are Hindus in religion. The Sinhalese are Aryans and their religion is Buddhism. The Tamils inhabit the north and the east of the island, the Sinhalese the remainder, right? And so I say like, wow, one, this is a footnote. So it's as if, you know, this is so natural to everyone in Ceylon. It's just the British people who may not know who need an explanation, right? That's why it's a footnote, right? For the outside reader. But look at the language he uses. And remember, like he's using race, right? Ethnicity isn't a term that's used till like after the middle of the 20th century in Ceylon, in Sri Lanka, right? So they're so separate. 
right? Their language, customs, and religion are different, right? But they're racially different. Sinhalese are Indo-Aryan, right? And if you think of like what's emerging in the early 20th century, think of like the Nazis and their claim that they were Aryan people and the Jews were not, right? So tying Sinhalese to like Indo-Aryan languages and Indo-Aryan racial stock is to mark the Sinhalese as connected to kind of a whiteness and a supremacy, right? And that the Tamils are forbidden and they're different and they're racially like of a different racial stock, right? And other terms he uses, wow, like in, the Tamils were originally inhabitants of India. So they're not really from Ceylon, they're other, right? And I think race is really about organizing populations into places of enclosure. So Tamils live in specific geographical places, but the rest of the country belongs to the Sinhalese, right? So it's this kind of, Separate. And, and it's so funny that all that was mm -hmm. implied in five kind of very deadpan sentences. Says, as a by the way. Exactly, right? which you are now unpacking. But, yeah. you know, even I would have read it had I not now been more aware of stuff as a throwaway line. Yeah. But those throwaway lines, in fact, are the most powerful in naturalizing some things. And this is the power of writing. That's right. And think of how he just does that, right? And this family, Silindu and his family, which are kind of in the novel, if you know the novel, in the village, they're one of the poorest families and they're maligned. And they're seen as like, you know, Silindu is this lazy farmer. And they're the girls, you know, their mother dies. So the girls are raised much more freely. And so they're seen as wild by the other villagers, right? But once they leave the village, and there's a scene where they're on pilgrimage to Katragama, right? And Wolf was in, like, was, uh, was an AGA or whatever uh, at the Katragama festival. So he, he calls it the Belagama festival in the novel, but it's the Katragama festival that he had observed, right? So as the villagers, this family moved to Katragama, they see these things, and there they see Tamils as absolutely other and themselves as joining the Sinhalese, who are always going to be Buddhist, right? So there's a simplification, a codification, a separation of people who are not really separate, as fundamentally different in practice, in their body. And there's another quote later where he says the Tamils are dark, their bodies are like, they're nude, they dress, you know, they're dressed in just a sarong, their bodies are dark and strange compared to the Sinhalese, right? So I think by this time, uh, what we could call scientific racism had been working its way through the island. And, you know, the census, like Mira has really documented this, the census had really classified the Sinhalese and the Tamil as racially different, as anatomically different. Maybe it was just coming up during that time also, Nimanti, because very interestingly, you have given a very quick um, number of races that existed before and after. And you're saying in 1835, mm -hmm. report on populations had only whites and blacks as the key categories of identification. The 1871 census used 78 nationalities and 24 races. However, by 1881, the census only had seven races, European, Sinhalese, Tamils, Mormon, Mormon, Malays, Vaddas, and others. Mm -hmm. Nationalities were not subsequently used. What was subsequently used, Nimanti? It's just these races. Race. 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 race as a category, I think, becomes the dominant form of describing people. And that the Sinhalese and Tamils are these two, two key races and that they're really different. And that they don't live with each other. That they live in these segregated ways. That becomes- exactly. You know, right. it's part of the divide and rule policy, right? And it's part of the fixing and codifying of people according to groups so that they can be managed, right? So, you know, Ashul Mbembe says race is a technology for governing population. Exactly. Um, in fact, I use that line in my PhD thesis as well, Nimanti. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
So because just just is a personal thing. What you did with English fiction is very similar to what I did with at in my PhD thesis with Sinhala fiction. Mm -hmm. Also, yeah. And also because I'm I'm very bilingual and I looked at it not from a capitalist leftist angle, but from his like the teaching of history or historical writing angle. So it, it is different in that sense. And I'm also fascinated by the fact of, you know, how simple sentences mm. are not just description. They are in fact create, creating right. as well as, you know, by saying Tamils live here, Sinhalese live here. He just erases the fact that there could have been mixed, you know, mixed places where people mixed with no kind of differentiation. How mm -hmm. easily, a very simple sentence can be very dangerous. Yeah. Naturalizing yeah. things. Naturalizing things that are only recently historically kind of produced, right? Um, so I think that's why language, like the study of literature for me is a central place from which to understand social issues because they tell us how ideology functions and in the hands of critical artists and writers and you know filmmakers they reveal to you and they denaturalize yes that we are asked to think of as oh this is how it's always been right the denaturalization is key i think right now um yeah. i'm going to end the discussion for for the first part because i'm i'm, I'm imagining this in parts and i'm really grateful you have the time to give me for that uh, the, the the cover picture we'll discuss last because you're referring to the artist in the in the final chapter. But can we talk about the um, title Nimanti? Because uh, it's it's a very uh, assembling ethnicities, ethnicity as something that you assemble. Why and not natural? Again, we we'll go back to where we you know stopped. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um... One is I have a whole chapter on the free trade zone workers and you know, they're workers in the assembly line, right? And I think of their, lots of feminist scholars have written like from Kanchana Rwanpura to Sandhya Hevamana, right? I have written beautifully and well about how their gender is has been and class has been assembled in the assembly line as they're switching garments. Correct. And we'll be doing first chapter in the next lecture. Right. So we do the introduction. Yeah. Right. I'm really interested in thinking of how ethnicity similarly is a social construct and it is assembled, made and remade, right? Within certain historical moments and during the war, it was made and remade in certain ways, global capitalism or free it's liberalization, right? Now we'll yeah. about it. We right. make ethnicity and race over and over again. But I'm also interested in thinking about assemblage. This is a this is assemblage theory um, uh, that I'm using to talk about how things are like there's a structure, but there's a way it comes together, right? So for example, there's this uh, feminist anthropologist, Iwa Ong. She says, you know, neoliberalism is a kind of assemblage. And by that, she means that it's, she says it's a mobile technology. So when 1977 and the UNP accepts liberalization, right? Or the open economy, what was going on in Sri Lanka with these ethnic tensions, right? So then free markets and ethno-nationalism kind of get entangled. They're assembled together, right? And they work with and that's beautifully explained when you use the Gamudava and you know how how it was sold to the people, which we will get to get yes. to later. So and also so assembling ethnicities in neoliberal times very clearly. You're you're looking at the context of how neoliberalism was sold to and is continuing in Sri Lanka. And then your 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 subtitle is ethnographic fictions, which we started with, yes. you know, and Sri Lanka's war, how we directly feeds into or was one of the causes, maybe the main one that's again uh, um, debatable, how it fed into what happened to us for 30 years. And um, Nimanti, so the reason I'm taking this slowly, so many new concepts, new or whatever, I think concepts that we need to know are being discussed here. And this was just to discuss the um, 
introduction with you and then we will have probably you know two or three chapters where we will discuss parts of it but not not completely because it will be too much i think okay. um, uh, to do it in one so thank you for today and i will repeat this in singhala and um, with whatever language level you have because i think i i've spoken to you in singhala and i know you can do it yeah. we will see whether we can also explain this in singhala in any case i'll be explaining without you uh the introduction first right okay. wonderful so, let me thank you again i know the conditions aren't easy you're with your baby here and you know you're in sri lanka and it can't be as peaceful as being at home at the moment so thank you for your time nimanti thank you so much madhubashini i'll see you soon bye bye